Mulberts. That's our word brought to you by Monsanto. Just kidding. I wish I was getting a check from them. Um, so I'm Jim Jesus. I'm here by myself today. I have no co-host because this is a, uh, a 25th ep- uh, se- in the series. Every 25 episodes, I want to do a solo episode where I kind of go after a libertarian Gregory. And what happened was on episode 25 was podcast day. I wanted to get something out. I couldn't get a regular co-host for that uh, episode. So what I did was I was just like, well, I'll just do one by myself. I'll just sit here and talk and I'll go over some of the, the, the or not some of, all of the 52 reasons or 52 pieces of evidence that showed that Lee Harvey Oswald killed JFK uh, alone uh, and kind of dispel a lot of the conspiracies that kind of go along with the JFK assassination. And it's not because I was trying to anger people or be a contrarian. It's just that these are, these are things that I that I that I find very valuable to me. Like these are I, like I'm very much against you know JFK conspiracies, and I'm also against uh, very much against like the whole anti-GMO kind of mindset as well. And I thought that this would be a very good topic to tackle for episode fifty. The problem was is this is a very complex topic with lots of things and lots of. Uh, kind of material to go through, and there's no way that I'm going to go through every single argument that is made against GMOs. But I'm going to—I kind of distilled it down to the big ones that I hear from libertarians and some from from the left as well. Now I don't know why there's a lot of anti-GMO sentiment inside of the Libertarian Party, considering what's going on with this whole thing. Uh, there are some things that are that ha- there there are problems in terms of libertarian theory um, with. Uh, Monsanto in particular, uh, including intellectual property, uh, lawsuits or whatever. But there's some stuff that I just don't get. Like, why are they all of a sudden very much against technology, like a certain kind of technology uh, that could be used for good or bad? Um, But, you know, why are they against that? And on top of that, why are they against kind of like people being able to uh, freely exchange goods and services and, unless it has like a warning label on it that states state, state sanction. Now, not all of them. I know not all of you who who are anti GMOs are for government mandated labeling. But I have run into uh, uh, people who say that they're anti state is who demand a government warning label on GMO products. So I kind of want to go over some of the history of Monsanto, but more into the kind of science behind GM crops and some of the misconceptions that people have. Now, I have a lot of notes here, so we're going to we're going to go through a lot of material. And like I said, I think that I may have bitten off more than I can chew because I wanted to have something that I could produce in a week like I did the last one because the information is really there. It's really easy to gather. Whereas anti-GMO stuff kind of seems to be all over the Internet and you have to kind of pick out pieces and figure out what people are arguing for or against and then try to go into the science really kind of understand what what's going on and then try to build off of that and i thought it was going to take me a week to do and here we are three weeks later (laughs) where since i started this whole thing um and even still my script is not done so towards the end of this thing i'm actually going to cut this episode it's going to be one uh, long piece up until then uh then i'm going to finish my notes and get ready um I also have episode 51 planned out. We also had new music and everything, too, um, which I hope you guys liked because there were some kind of people who, who didn't like the, the other music. We're not going to go back to the old music, but uh, we actually went back to the, the old artist and picked out a, a brand new song. So I hope you guys dig that. Um, uh, is there anything else? Yeah. So like, I kind of wanted to break the mold for this episode. and You're going to get this again in 75. I'm going to work on 75 a little bit earlier. So that way I'm able to produce a little bit more content and not be strapped down by numbers. And so that way I'll just have something ready in advance and I can just re- record it real quick because my notes are right there and then move on to the next episode because I want to make this a weekly show. And I've been really bad about it this uh, this last month or this last 30 days, rather not really last month uh, where I didn't get an episode out. The week before, and then this week I only got one episode out, and I wanted to have two, but we're hitting 50 now, and I have to produce this thing, and I still was not done with the script, because there is so much to go over. Either way. So kind of starting out. Um, So we need to kind of talk a little bit about Monsanto, how it started, why it started, what they originally did, and some of the things that they may have been involved with earlier on in in their firm. So... There's kind of like two different Monsantos. Actually, there's probably three now. Um, now that they've been bought by uh, by the Bayer Corporation, um, which produces like aspirin and pharmaceuticals. Um, 
but the old Monsanto is very much different from the new Monsanto, which is probably different now, the new, new Monsanto, since it's uh, just like a subdivision of another corporation. But the old Monsanto was, uh, well, old Monsanto, more Monsanto was founded in 1901 as a chemical company, and it specialized in producing things like saccharin, caffeine, vanillin, which is like a synthetic vanilla flavoring. And later they expanded to Europe and started producing things like aspirin and rubber additives. Later, they started making things like LED lights, um, astroturf, herbicides, uh, more on this later, and optoelectronics. They also produced uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, but it really wasn't until the 1980s that they started producing biotechnology, which is the kind of the focus of what we're going to be talking about today um, for that reason. Now, since then, Monsanto has been... Um, They've sold off portions of their company. They've been ac uh, acquired by other companies, and they've been kind of sold back and forth. And so the company that exists today is very much different than the company that existed in 1980, let alone 1970, let alone 1960, which is very important because we're going to be talking about uh, what they do now, or actually what what they did, uh, what they what they do now versus what they did in 1960. So old Monsanto is very important uh, because when you talk to people about Monsanto, you end up, inevitably end up talking about Agent Orange. Um, you know, Monsanto invented Agent Orange. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with Agent Orange, or the, during the Vietnam War, uh, the Viet Cong were very good at guerrilla-style war, like the U.S. in, in their early days. Uh, they were more familiar with the terrain than the United States government, uh, than the United States uh, Army was. So... Uh, they were able to kind of hide behind bushes and they knew the trees and they knew the forest very well. And they were able to kind of go and hit, hit, uh, kill, kill a lot of Americans and then run, run back. And it was pretty much what we, what we, what, what the American government did, <laughs> what the American government did, um, in, in the, uh, in the revolutionary war. So, um, so an attempt to try to clear out the foliage of the jungles to kind of make it a little bit more even playing field, um, the U.S. government began pro began programs to kind of clear all this stuff out. Um, napalm was one tactic, but another one was a series of herbicides called the Rainbow Herbicides, and uh, in a, in a, in a program called Operation Ranch Hand. Now there are many of them with each of the different color coding code names, but the most notorious ones were Agent Orange. I mean, there was like Agent Blue or Agent Purple. I don't really know if those exact ones were existed, but it kind of gives you the idea. But the, so Agent Orange is a mixture of two different chemicals. It's 245T and 24D. Now, when it was deployed, it caused some serious health issues for the local population, including damaged genes, birth defects, leukemia, Hodgkin's lymphoma, and cancer. These effects, uh, the effects of those sprays still have effects even today, uh, where traces of the chemical still causes these problems to the local population. So you can still kind of Google image search things that happened within the last couple of years with, with birth defects as a result of uh, the, chemical, uh, the, chemi uh, the chemicals that they were spraying back in the 60s. Now, there was some massive legal consequences for the United States, and the U.N. ratified a resolution to, to ban environmental modification and lawsuits on the behalf of veterans um, and the people of Vietnam as well. So really, how does that kind of relate back to Monsanto? Um, one of the claims is that they invented Agent Orange. Uh, this is false. <laughs> they did not invent Agent Orange. Um, so uh, both of those chemicals, chemicals were produced back uh, for, for in Agent Orange, were produced back um, and developed by the British and U.S. governments in World War II. Uh, the plan was to use it on ja uh, Japan if the war continued, but they ended up nuking or <laughs> whole different thing about <laughs> about the world war ii uh they actually surrendered we didn't accept their, their their conditions for surrender and then we nuked them and then we allowed them to have that exact same uh surrender um protocols whatever but they were planning on using this instead uh the chemicals were tested heavily since vietnam and they didn't really see too many issues uh when it was used very sporadically in military uh in a military capacity outside of vietnam um Wait, so were there problems with it like in Vietnam? Well, 
kind of, yeah, no. Uh, there were some issues, and I'm not going to say that it was all okay. It definitely wasn't. But Vietnam definitely got the bulk of the problems. Some of the problems had a prov- uh, some of the problems had provable links between what what was happening with Agent Orange and the effects um, that it allegedly caused. Others did not. Um, but this is where things get a little bit difficult, okay? So the two chemicals themselves, Northern Mixture, doesn't have the kind of detrimental effects like we saw in Vietnam. Uh, the reason why we saw this happening in Vietnam was because a third chemical, TCDD, which contained um, a contamination that was inherent in the way that it was synthesized, or it was very common in the way that it was synthesized. So during the Vietnam War, Agent Orange and other chemicals were contracted out in a series of chemical producers, including Monsanto. Um, they were given specific uh, specifications on how to produce the chemical, uh, in in which there was a faulty uh, cont- uh, which which was faulty, which resulted in a contamination. So the government contracted these companies to produce it according to these recipes. By the way, Monsanto was not the only producer of Agent Orange. Both companies like Dow uh, Chemical. Um, and Diamond Shamrock were also producers of the chemical, along with four other firms. Yet we only hear like this hate spewed about Monsanto and to a lesser degree Dow, um, but that has more to do with the Bull Pill disaster and people have a pro- having a problem with that. And they're just kind of finding a link to Agent Orange. But for the most part, we never hear about the other, the other uh, you know, firms that were producing Agent Orange. We only really talk about it in terms of Monsanto. So Agent Orange was an atrocity for sure, um, but to put the blame solely at the feet of Monsanto was extremely disingenuous. The U.S. government were the ones who developed the process that caused the contamination. They were the ones who commissioned it, and not just through Monsanto, but they were also the ones that decided to use it in the war. They were the ones spraying it in the war. They're the ones that pulled the trigger. They are the ones that are completely at fault. Sure, there should be some blame that that Monsanto and the six other firms um, that produced it played a role because they still took the contract. But blaming Monsanto alone is not a very honest interpretation of the events. Um, I don't want to kind of dive into too much about, you know, like should a, should a firm uh, contract with the government? Is it more ethical, especially when it, in terms of producing chemicals for the war? Well, this... We need to understand that, yeah, sure, they should be ascribing to the libertarian philosophy or, you know, some sort of some sort of, you know, anti-government philosophy and not work with government or anti-war philosophy and not work with the government in terms of the war. But you got to remember, this is 1960. There was a big Red Scare at the time. This whole war was sold uh, even by the Democrats who sold this war initially as an anti, you know, communist thing, because communist was seen as a real big threat. On top of that, you didn't have people like Rothbard synthesizing libertarianism quite yet. It wasn't until a little bit later where you started getting um, that sort of philosophy, getting a little bit more into vogue, but it's not nearly in vogue, even in the 70s as it was compared to, you know, even in the late 2000s, let alone today. So I'm not completely excusing Monsanto, but if we're going to say that Monsanto is an evil corporation because of Agent Orange, I think you're being very disingenuous, which we should be saying is the government's absolutely terrible. Yeah, Monsanto shouldn't have produced it. Maybe they shouldn't have taken that contract, but the contract specified how they needed to make it, which resulted in that contamination. Uh, And the government should be the real, they're the ones with the blood on their hands, right? You know, for, for the most part, for the most part, uh, Monsanto's name was uh, Mud. So the new Monsanto today is very much different than it was in the 1960s, as we kind of talked about earlier. Now Monsanto's focus seemed to be on agriculture, and they consolidated and sold off a lot of unrelated properties in the 2000s, um, and they were kind of bought and sold back and forth uh, between various firms, um, and they kind of looked around the playing field at the time when they were a chemical company and they started back in the eighties and they started saying like, look, we really don't have like the technology or any kind of patents, which we'll get into later. We don't really have any of uh, those sort of things. So why uh, are we still playing this field? Because if we play in this field, we're kind of small competitors. We're small fry we need to start looking into other things because otherwise we're going to get acquired. They end up getting acquired later, but, but they were really kind of uh, afraid of kind of getting just bought up by a corporation, 
just for their for, for you know for their intellectual property and then just kind of chopped up and moved into another firm. So they were really kind of concerned about that. They still wanted to to be their own their own firm. So they started getting into biotechnology. And that's that's kind of where they are today and they and they kind of specialize in GM crops and fertilizers uh, and not for well maybe fertilizers but m- mostly into kind of uh agricultural technologies, GM seeds. Uh, e- even hybrid seeds as well, not just GM. Uh, and they also kind of delve into um, pesticides, herbicides, those sort of things. So let's kind of get into the kind of domestication of crops, because this is really important when we're talking in terms of genetic modification. We need to kind of understand what, what it is. A lot of people have this kind of very, um, what's the term, kind of romanticized ver- version of what Earth was like before uh, modern agriculture kind of came into uh, came into play. So most of the crops that we eat today are never found in nature. Nearly none of them. Uh, the foods we eat today, fruits, vegetables, grains, and even animals, uh, are nowhere to be found uh, before man came into the scene and their ancestors started uh, taking those varieties uh, and and gr- breeding them uh, so that they're hardly representative of what of what was found in the wild as the versions that we eat today. Uh, modern corn looks nothing like like what the wild versions of it were. If you go and find pictures of uh, old corn, it almost looks like a weird kind of like wheat. It's it's bizarre. Um, they, you know, they they look nothing like the, the the yellow tubes of sweet goodness that we that we recognize it today. Now, how this was done traditionally was through selective breeding. Humans would grow or raise food that they fa- uh, f- that that they found. Uh, and if a tree produced, say, like an apple with more fruit or a chicken with larger breast sections, people would then, you know, breed that and stop breeding those that didn't have those particular traits. And over time, this, the, the traits that we liked, we bred out uh, or this, we bred in and the ones that we didn't like, all the, 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 the traits that we didn't like, we bred out. We stopped breeding with them. Or having bred them for for that, so the modern chicken, the modern cow, <laughs> looks nothing like uh, what you would find in the wild if if man had not domesticated them. So over time, the tiny little boring apple that was mostly made of seeds and it was kind of bitter turned into a huge sweet red orbs with very small seed selections. They also uh, selected for things like drought and pest resistance as well. So when aunties bring up like an appeal to nature, it's rather absurd because none of these people are eating wild varieties of food and nature doesn't have a great track record of being a measurement for safety. Um, See the very toxic, uh, very toxic, undomesticated potatoes, uncooked cashews, even like poison ivy and dart frogs. Like no one would say that like, oh, but it's natural. It's okay for you. Um, Nature produces very toxic things, not just to humans, but the environment as well. Secondly, humans are natural last time i checked and why we create a product well when we create things it's still technically a product of nature um i mean would we say that honey is why would we say that honey is natural but an abacus is not i mean honey exists because of the painstaking labor that thousands of all bees working together to produce so sure there are some products that were born by humans but in uh, but the hands of humans and and tools is kind of a product of nature. Like we came out of nature. Therefore what we produce also is in innate in nature as well. Uh, it's kind of like, I don't remember the exact quote, but Shakespeare said something along the lines of, aren't we, aren't we not nature ourselves? Um, so humans are very good at creating tools and we're very good at deductive reasoning and logic and, and thinking. Um, rational rationally some of us are allegedly but one of the tools that humans um was used was the domestication of crops was genetic modification this kind of came a whole lot later and that's what gm is it's not some kind of like malicious deed it's a tool like any tool it can be used and even abused um you know, you could use a saw to build a house you can use it to build a crappy house and you can also uh you know that could fall and kill everybody in, inside or you can use it to saw someone's head off uh, gm is one of many tools used to modify the genes of crops just like selective breeding though there are very different methods uh, none of which includes stabbing a tomato with a syringe okay that's 
that's actually a little bit more of the of the organic thing. We'll get into that in just a second. What they all share in common is that genes are um, sequenced, and they notice genes that provide traits, uh, and they add genes to the DNA of that with that sp very specific trait. Then they can grow them out and see if they were successful, and then they test them. Uh, they test them for human environmental safety, get government approval because the government has lots and lots of regulatory bodies that that really check these things. It's almost as bad as drugs are, uh, getting drug approval in the United States. Uh, and then once they meet the conditions, then they're approved for commercial sale. Now, there's only a certain th group of, of uh, particular uh, crops that are allowed to be sold in the United States. They're very limited. So when I start seeing things like, oh, these peppers are non-GMO, it's like, well, there's no commercially available GM peppers. Why are we even mentioning this? It's things like corn, canola, um, cotton, um, papayas. Um, and then I guess there's there's like a um, – there is a uh, uh, an apple that's actually going to be coming out pretty soon. And there's something else. We'll get into that at the very end of the episode of all the different types of genetically modified crops. So that if you're still kind of concerned about it, you can kind of use this as like a big trump card. Uh, and, and to kind of singling out anything that is anti-GMO if you're still not convinced by uh, what I'm going to be saying. So today, GM crops um, are not limited to, but mostly are targeted towards improving pest resistance, being able to survive certain uh, pesticides and herbicides, and or to improve shelf life. So the health risks. This is one of the things that gets brought up a lot. And I, I, I really have a hard time wrapping my head around people, why people believe this crap, uh, but they do. Um, so where exactly are the risks? I mean, like, like any good thing being introdu introduced into a market, there's always, so, there's also a potential for hazards. It's possible for a GM product to produce ke a chemical that's toxic to humans. It's also possible for a GM product to be resistant to a pesticide that is environmentally damaging. But at the same time, it's also true for a all these other ways of modifying uh, crops, um, traditional including selective breeding. With GM crops, there's very specific changes that can be made to the plant's genome. Un unlike selective breeding, which is mostly a constant Hail Mary pass trying to get the traits that you want, um, and if you're able to pinpoint that particular trait through bioengineering, you're more likely to isolate that specific trait, whereas crossbreeding would be a total crapshoot. So you may get, if you're trying to get like a, a more sweeter apple and, you, and you've figured out that this particular tree produces more uh, sweeter apples, then you can try to breed out them through seeds, but the seeds are going to have a lot of other genetic variations as well, up to and including not being as sweet uh, as, as the mother plant. And what you want to do is try to isolate those and try to improve those genes and make them a little bit more uh, more consistent. Um, so yeah, you're you're much more likely to get negative outcomes through selective breeding than you are through GM crops because you're specifically targeting what you want. If you want a sweeter apple, you can find the gene that create that that produces sugars and improve that gene and tweak it and then run it out and test it. Uh, and find the one that actually does produce that trait that you want and then breed it out. Whereas if you're going to be doing selective breeding, you have to be uh, getting a, collecting a lot of those seeds or just cloning, um, which cloning has, has some issues as well in terms of um, in, ter in terms of, of uh, selling it on a consumer market or, or to, to, to farmers. Uh, it's a lot easier to just sell seed. <clears throat> so even still, there's a lot of, um, there's still a lot of uh, health risks that come up. So will it make your kids grow a penis out of his ear hole? Like, no. Um, will it make them autistic? Uh, also known as libertarianism? Uh, no. Uh, does it cause cancer? No. Well, there's, there's no evidence at all that kind of support this. And there's a very solid con uh, scientific consensus to the contrary. Uh, GM crops are no more harmful than conventional or even organic crops. Uh, conversely, there's no evidence to show that conventional or organic crops are any better for you uh, th than the latter. So a team of Italian scientists reviewed over 1,700 peer-reviewed papers and independent studies on GM crops and found that there is no evidence whatsoever that GM crops are any more harmful than conventional crops. And, quote, the scientific research conducted so far has not detected any significant hazards directly connected to the use of genetically, modif uh, genetically engineered crops, unquote. 
This is telling because Italy has not been very favorable to GM crops in the past. Um, these studies were merged into the gene, or they're going to be merged into the genera. I wrote this down as if they were, and then I checked it. I forgot to, to edit this. Uh, they're, they're planning on doing it. Right now, uh, genera has, I think, about 600 studies of their own. So there's going to be, uh, you know, about over 2,000 once they get merged in this particular uh, in this particular database. Um so yeah, there's about 2,000 studies overall that show that there there is no evidence whatsoever to support the claim that GM commercially available GM crops that are out today are any worse for you than traditional crops. Now I'm sure that there are some studies that you can probably bring up to the contrary, and we'll be getting to those towards the end of the show. Um, and we should definitely look at the concerns on those as well. Um, but we're going to save that for later. We're just talking about the overall consensus of the data over all branches. This is also includes uh, studies done by independent groups like universities or uh, non-governmental bodies, as well as com ones commissioned by Monsanto, which you can't just discredit just because Monsanto paid for it. Because if you do, then you have to discredit virtually every uh, study that shows that GM crops is terrible for you that we're going to be kind of refuting later on in the video. Uh, video. In the uh, in the podcast, but um, this is very important. You know, like you just can't discredit it. You have to look at the science. And independent groups have peer reviewed these these uh, these studies that were commissioned by Monsanto and other uh, bio uh, bio uh, engineering companies as well. So you just can't completely discredit it because there's a financial incentive. You know, uh, but we'll get into that in a bit. So one of the ones that we that gets brought up uh, a lot. Let me take a sip of my coffee here. Uh, Brian Sovereign style, I guess, uh, is BT toxin. That's Bacterius thuringiensis. Thur I don't think it's even possible to say this with a human mouth. Uh, thuringiensis or BT. So we're going to be calling it BT. So BT is a bacteria that produces a crystalline protein. It's a delta endotoxin, which uh, has insecticidal properties. It works by interacting with chemicals found uh, in Lip, lip, lipidoptera, there we go, and lipidoptera insects, uh, stomachs that is not found in most organisms on earth. It's only found in these particular ones. Think about it like a key. Like I have a key and this particular key only opens up my lock. It does not open up any of my neighbor's locks. It only opens up my lock. I mean, theoretically, you could probably find like one species later on down the line where it's possible, but the odds are very much against that. Um, so it only works within certain, it only works in a certain family. And even of that family, it only works in certain um, in certain species of that, and on top of that, there's even certain species where it'll work in the larva stage, but it won't like affect uh, like a later once it you know cocoons and becomes a moth or a butterfly, it won't affect those. Um, so it's it, it's completely uh, it's it's not going to be found in any at least at least the kind of keyhole the the certain types of pores that this this will uh, that this chemical this proton pro, uh, this in, this crystalline protein endotoxin will uh, so we humans don't have this particular hole in our stomach so it can't attack it so it's completely harmless to humans. Um, it's also completely harmless to things like honeybees, dogs, cats, or anybody who are uh, even even other types of pests, including aphids and flies. They're, they won't go after them. It really only kind of targets things like caterpillars or moths that are very devastating to uh, crops, especially crops like uh, cotton. But mostly this this thing, this is really kind of gets bizarre, is that Bt toxin, has been used in organic farming since the 1920s. Yeah. BT toxin has been used in organic farming primarily. So this was kind of interesting for um, for like a firm like Monsanto to produce it for a GM crop is because they figure, hey, this is something that has a very long track record of being safe for humans uh, and safe for honeybee populations. So why not try to figure out a way to kind of teach a plant to make it on their own. So what biotech firms have done is they've taken the genes that are responsible for producing this crystalline toxin and gave it the the plants the ability to produce their own so that when a, pen, a pest att uh, attempts to eat the crop, they die. But it's only for certain types of insects, specifically 
Lepidoptria insects. Um, some pests have resistance, others don't. This is going to be common for any pesticide. There, there will be some resistances built up for, for some. Um, but the reason why it's common is because you know, it'll kill things like worms, but it's, uh, it doesn't kill beneficial insects like honeybees, and its effect on humans are negligible at best. So people have this this kind of problem where they they consider if, if it's bad for one organism, it has to be bad for everything else, right? Um, not true, <laughs> because we all know not to feed chocolate to our dogs, but we're very happy to eat it for ourselves because um, caffeine is toxic to dogs. Grapes is also a toxic. Um, so, you know, enjoying grapes and cocoa, uh, cocoa products like chocolate are, are dangerous for dogs. Um, things which are very beneficial for humans like avocados and onions are very toxic to birds. This is why it's possible for a pesticide to kill a worm, but not a bee or a human. Now, often when I bring up uh, BT as a pesticide used in organic farming, they're quick to point out like, well, no, 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 hold on. There's a difference between something being sprayed on a plant that you can wash off versus it having it inside the food. But this also displays like a lack of understanding about organic farming uh, practices today uh, or even how microorganism functions. Bacteria can get inside of food. I don't know if you know this or not. Even if they're they're harmless, they can still get inside of the food, uh, and they do. That aside, that aside, uh, the problem with this is that one of the ways that organic farms have used and implemented PT, not all the time, but very a very common thing is what they'll do is they'll put it inside of a syringe and inject the plant with the beat uh, with the with the bacteria that produces this toxin so it's actually yes it's inside of the food as well uh even if you were to try to say that the bacteria doesn't get inside of the food when you when you spray it on them now i find this inter uh, entertaining because a lot of the anti-gmo propaganda they like to use a lot of images of scientists injecting plants with a syringe but that's not the case with gmos like that's not how they create gmos they it's a very kind of weird complex in fact you can actually go to the monsanto website and they actually show you how they do it it's kind of interesting how they um how they kind of do that whole process and we're not going to get into that but the the idea that they they take a tomato and they inject it with something and then they put it on the market like that's not what GMOs do. <laughs> that's the final product. Like they want to get it to that point. Why would they then inject it with pe pesticides if they're just going to put it on the, on the supermarket shelf? Um, but anyways, yeah. But it, but it's fine that they inject uh, inject BT inside of organic crops because they're humans to people the. The, the organisms that it really matters most, and that's humans, their pets, uh, who may eat, like, you know, GM corn inside of uh, dog food, um, and beneficial insects like bees and stuff, and even some harmful ones as well. So why use it? Um, so before the, the commercialization of GM crops, 50% of insecticide use was just on cotton alone. That's a fuckload of pesticides because BT cotton pesticide – um, makes it reduces the 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 need for for pesticides, which is good for the environment as well. We get a lot of stuff from from anti GMO people. They say that they 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 use even more of this stuff because you know it's resistant to it. Well, that's not true. The reason why they want to make Roundup res we'll get into Roundup resistance in a bit, but you know, the reason why they want to use a lot more pesticides. Uh, is, is because, you know, like there is n there's less resistance in the plant themselves. So when you give the plants the ability to withstand certain types of herbicides that, that are probably better for the environment, you can use less of them uh, if they're more if they're more potent in, in terms of what they're supposed to be doing and not the environment. We'll get into that later. So one of the things that, that kind of gets brought up with BT cotton, uh, I mean, like there's BT corn as well, um, but we already kind of went over why that's, that shouldn't be, be too much of a problem. But it be, uh, there's, there's two reasons uh, when it comes to cotton, because you're like, well, I don't eat cotton. Why would I care if my cotton on my shirt is GM, right? Like what, what problem with that? Like it's not going to give me cancer, I don't think, because I'm going to wash all the carcinogens off or, or maybe it's stuck onto them forever. I don't know. Um, but one of the things there's, there's two big arguments that kind of go against BT cotton specifically, and it both has to do with India for some reason. Uh, it's very weird that all the problems of, uh, of GM crops are very isolated in India. That wouldn't probably, that would probably tell you that there's not something with the BT, uh, itself. It has something to do 
maybe around what's going on in India. That that seems to be the Occam's razor, razor there. So there's um, there's been like suicides in India uh, with farmers. There was a report that came out that says that hundreds of farmers were committing suicide because of BT cotton. Uh, well, there, first of all, we can just we can just discredit this because there's no evidence that shows that it's BT cotton or anything that has to do with with uh, relating to like uh, any kind of chemical relation between BT co- growing BT cotton and you know like any kind of health risk that would that would lead to s- depression or suicide because it would be more than just India, because there's a lot of American farmers that use BT uh, cotton as well. But the real blame when people bring this up, some people have made the former, um, but the latter claim is, is the the one that that's made more often is that it's being it's because of financial uh, the financial aspects of of using BT cotton. Um, they say that because the seed costs more and that they're forced to use it, they go broke and then they have to kill themselves because of financial ruin. Uh, here's a problem with that scenario. No one in, in India is being forced to use Monsanto seed or BT cotton seed. There's been an a, epidemic of suicide amongst males in India for quite some time now, and the government has recognized it. And it has largely to do with economic reasons, but it's outside of seed purchasing. In the United States, if you want to be a farmer, uh, you can go to a bank or even a venture capitalist, I guess, uh, and get the funds from them and and start a business. And if something were to happen, there's resources that those lenders can use as leverage um, that results in fairly peaceful processes of, um, you know, of liquidating uh, bad assets. So if, if you uh, went to a bank or to a venture capitalist and borrowed money, uh, they would say, okay, so you have to pay us back with interest and here it is. And if you don't pay us back, we're going to acquire your farm Um to, to kind of recoup any costs that we get. Uh, we're also going to take any kind of infrastructure and then we're going to sell it off at auction. Um, this is not the case in India because India has a very big lack of, or not a very big lack. They actually have, it, it's a complete lack of a financial sector. Uh, if you want to be a farmer and you don't have cash on hand to buy all the stuff, uh, you have to go to a loan shark. And if you don't pay the loan shark back, very bad things will happen to you. So if a farmer goes and buys land, equipment, seed, fertilizer, pesticides, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and something and he gets plagued with a bunch of problems, like bad harvest or whatever, you're pretty much going to be sleeping, sleeping with the fishes. And they're not going to be particularly nice about it either. They're going to be breaking your legs uh, before they finally off you, uh, you, know, it, it, you know, if you're lucky enough to survive the encounter. So you can understand why suicide might be a faster and more preferable way to get out of debt. The solution to that would be uh, to kind of reform, either reform or abolish, I'd, I prefer the latter, uh, <laughs> the, the governments in India. The, the government in India is one of the most crazily socialist countries uh, in the world that still kind of has like this, this weird, they have a constitution that is insanely long. Like I think there's only, um, I'm not sure. I think California is, is either comparable or, or longer. And California has things written in their constitution, like boxing regulations. Like it's that, it's that detailed. It's one of the longest ones in the world. And it's one of the constitutions that, um, that even like, a hardcore status nut jobs will look at and say, this is a prime example of what you don't want a constitution to be. Um, India is really bad. And one of the things they like to, to prevent and kind of crack down on is usury. Um, so kind of going like, that should be the solution there. Like there's no, there's no law or there's no thing on the book that says that you have to buy Monsanto seed. And often what Monsanto does is that they don't actually sell their products there. What they do is they sell in bulk. So it's cheaper for the farmers there. They sell in bulk seed to seed distributors uh, there. And then those seed companies will just repackage their seeds and brand it as their own. Um, So, Yeah. So no one's being forced to do it. There's there's plenty of different alternatives that people can grow out there. They don't have to buy uh, BT cotton. The other thing that we're told is that cotton seed, which is used as a live, because cotton seed is actually not. They don't just throw that away anymore. Like this is a this is a supplemental uh, feed, and it causes. Um, and what they allege is that the the BT cotton seed like causes whole large livestock populations to die off, and there's simply no evidence to this whatsoever i mean none the claim is made and they just say like oh yeah like some farmer 
had like a, 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 had a crop of hundreds of thousands of sheep and they went and grazed in, in a cotton field that was BT cotton and they all died. And there's no evidence to support that that, w- that even happened at all. Like no pictures, no nothing. There's no reports of it. It's just a claim. Uh, and on top of that, the, the livestock that large in India does not exist. They, they just they just don't exist. Um, but yeah, there's there's no picture, not even no pictures, no nothing, and it's completely un, uh, unsubstantiated whatsoever. And like this is a world that we live in now, where like 30 minutes after Michael Phelps hits a bong, like everybody knows about it, um, but not one picture has has been taken of these of these uh, the, you know these livestock being uh, wiped out and massed. Now you could say that well, it's India. It's completely different. Like they don't have cell phones, which is not true. They actually have more. The per capita cell phone use is much more prevalent in India and always has been than the United States, which is kind of a weird thing. If people think that well, everybody has cell phones there. Well, actually, no. Uh, per capita, you can uh, Japan would uh, would be it would be a much more of a culture where they have uh, cell phones. They have they have a really weird cell phone culture over there, uh, as well as India. But I don't think it's a, it's a is it is ex- extreme as it is in Japan. Mm-mm-mm. So yeah, that's kind of the thing with BT. If you oppose BT, then stop eating organic because chances are you're eating BT. So Roundup, let's talk about Roundup. Roundup, glyphosate. Roundup is an herbicide of a, um, it's a, it's a brand name of, of glyphosate. And it's a synthetic herbicide that has, uh, that's basically like a, like a phosphate. Um, and it was discovered by Mon- uh, Monsanto chemists in the mid seventies and the patent for it just recently expired. So any company can actually produce glyphosate. I actually, I was actually talking to someone, um, not going to mention her name, uh, but I was actually talking to someone and she was saying like, you know, Monsanto has all these patents for, you know, all these herbicides and, you know, especially Roundup and, and, you know, they don't let anybody use it and you're forced to use all these things because they're the only ones that work now. And it's like, you do know that anybody could just make glyphosate now. It's the patents over. So anyway, um, <laughs> so yeah, so this gets a lot of attention because, um, because of a GM crop known as Roundup Ready uh, seeds. So glyphosate is a very powerful herbicide. It can destroy most weeds and even crops. Um, and that was a problem. And they wanted to use this stuff because it, it they could use less of it. They didn't need to you know, hose down the crops with, with uh, pesticides like they normally do with conventional and even organic crops. Um, so that was a huge... So that was a huge hurdle is that they wanted to figure out a way to kind of get this herbicide to to be in in a, in, a, in, a, in a farming area. And it's also harmless to humans. We'll get into that in a bit. Now, Monsanto has used GM technologies that would allow some crops to be unaffected by this chemical. And that's what, how we get Roundup Ready seeds. So Roundup and Roundup Ready produce have been shown to be uh, non-toxic to humans uh, with some caveats, right? You know, sure, it's a bad idea to chuck a bottle of it, you know. And people like always do that. Like, well, you know, if you, if you think Roundup is so good, why don't you go buy a bottle? Because you can buy a bottle at Walmart. Uh, why don't you go buy a bottle of it and just chug it? It's like, well, do you think salt is okay for you? Like, why, you know, do you think that putting like salt on your food is like horrible and it's carcinogenic thing that's going to kill you? Like, why don't you eat a whole box of it? The difference between a medicine or whatever is pretty much the – or a poison is a dose, right? I think we've all heard that term before. If, if I put a little bit of salt on my food, just a little bit of salt on my food, it's, it's going to be good for me, right? I'm not going to say glyphosate is going to be good for you in small doses and you should drink it. Actually, there's a study we'll get into later that says that, uh, which is really interesting. Uh, so, But, you know, we, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't say that, you know, because if you ate an entire box of salt or just, you know, ate an entire salt lick and chewed on a salt lick, uh, you will die from doing that, uh, that you shouldn't have salt at all. Um, it really depends on it. So the, the amount that you're getting, even in, even if you were to just drink the, you know, um, like water that was heavily contaminated with glyphosate, you, you wouldn't be in any big problem unless it was like you were drinking an entire bottle or if it was a half and half mix or something. So you, you don't want to drink it, but you know, if, 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 if your food has a little bit out of it on there, it's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. If it really bothers you, you can wash it off. Um, so yeah, so, so, so eating too much of anything is going to be bad for you, period. Um, so yeah, uh, we're going to get a little bit more into the roundup ready, especially when we talk about some of the science, uh, end of it as well. But 
every single study that has been peer reviewed, accepted, accredited journals entry on these things. We're going to do some of the ones that aren't. Uh, they have shown that this stuff is completely harmless to humans. Uh, so long as you're not drinking an entire bottle of it, because that would be stupid. So the environmental risk, like like any kind of macro organ, uh, macro uh, agricultural methods, there's going to be significant negative environmental impacts that just simply can't be ignored. Uh, most fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides causes chemical runoffs um, that can get into water sources. Some of these crops that can, can seep into the wild can be both negatively and positively, for that matter, impact other plants and neighboring crops or even in the wild. But this isn't limited to GM crops. In fact, GM crops are usually kind of made with this in mind. Uh, so if a plant if a plant like repels an insect on its uh, on its own or resistance to glyphosate, um, then it requires less of these chemicals that they have to spray on it because they could just use this one in moderately doses because it's a whole lot stronger. Um, yeah. So I mean. There's always going to be problems with it, and it's not. It's also includes organic crops as well. Like there's 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 definitely negative impacts. Just farming in general is is not exactly the best thing for the environment in any respect. It's not just you know vegetable crops, but also animal crops as well. There's always going to be problems, and to say that it's only limited to GM crops is completely unfounded. There, these things get tested regularly um, for I environmental impacts as well. It's not just for health impacts. And what they co continuously conclude is that, look, this stuff isn't as bad as some of the things that we do for conventional crops or even organic crops as well. You, we have to use less, we can, we have the ability to use less pesticides now that you know it, herbs or uh, herbs now that now that um now that these certain plants can be resistant to pests on their own so it's ter terminator seeds this is this is a really quick one um they're not being made and they're not being used and there's no plans to make or use them because monsanto recognizes that people don't want them we could just move right along, uh, but I'm not going to. I, I guess we'll talk about it a little bit more. Um, Monsanto has never even attempted to make Terminator seeds uh, because they even they see it as a problem as very problematic if, it, if this kind of stuff gets out in the wild. Um, they did kind of they did issue a patent, uh, and it, it's kind of an exploratory patent. They're, they didn't actually patent any particular gene or any particular seed, nor do they sell or make this stuff. Um, when people say like, oh, do you support Terminator, uh, Terminator seeds? It's, it's completely nonsense. Like there's a patent for it. I mean, there's patents for like, a, you know, a cure for AIDS. It doesn't work, but there's a patent for it. <laughs> so, I mean, just because there, there was, they issued a patent, like an exploratory patent on it doesn't exactly mean that they, that they sell it. Um, which is but this whole thing kind of like interests me as well. It's like you're upset. A lot of people are upset of, about cross pollinization, and we'll get into that in a bit. But there, there, a lot of people talk about in Terminator seeds like, oh, it's bad. Uh, but at the same time, in the next breath, they'll talk about like, but this stuff can get out in the wild and it can reproduce and cause environmental impacts. And well, it's like, well, wouldn't you want if if these genes you don't want to get out in the wild if they do end up cross pollinating another plant for that not to not to work if they produce seed wouldn't you want that but apparently they don't so it's it's really kind of weird it's like pick one there are there are environmental impacts of a terminator seed for sure um just like there would be environmental impacts of the letter i think the terminator seed would be a, 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 a an environmental impact that would be worse um but i mean like if, if you're concerned is that it's going to get into the wild then you definitely don't want them to have another generation right um so, yeah, so Terminator Seeds, it's complete nonsense fabrication. I think this we may be making this under two hours. Wow, I'm already halfway through my notes. Uh, well, I still have a little bit more to go because I'm, re I'm actually going to abrupt this. Uh, I don't know if I said this. I tried. I, I actually did another take. I don't know if I mentioned it in this take, but um, I'm pretty much like 95% done with my notes. I got like five more to do, and so I'm going to cut it off. But I'm going to keep this in one take. Uh-uh-uh. Mm -mm. And I'm not going to edit it either, uh, which you probably noticed by now. So um, another thing that people talk about is that it's illegal to replant seed. Ooh, it's so terrible. Like the farmers aren't allowed to harvest their own seed. Um, 
So farmers in, in modern days have just found it far more economical to just buy new seed for every planting uh, than it is to, tar- to take the time and portion out a lot of their crops in order to reinvest it into producing seed. I mean, even organic and conventional crops have kind of moved away from this practice. But, but l- besides that, let's say that they did. And actually, these farmers want to re- uh, harvest their seed and replant them. Here's where we get into some problems. First of all, if you if you if you are a seed produ- or if you're if you're a farmer and you're buying seed from Monsanto, in order for you to buy seed from Monsanto, you have to fill out a, you have to sign a contract with Monsanto saying, like I, I plan on buying this much from you. Um, I plan on re uh, having harvests of this every so often. When I do harvest every so often, I'm going to buy seeds from you. And here's here's our contract in order to do this. You are signing a deal with Monsanto saying that you are not going to replant seed. You are making a voluntary agreement with someone. Why do you have a problem with people voluntary interacting with people? What is the problem that you need to say, no, that particular voluntary transaction is not, uh, you know, is bad. Even though there's no victim, you want to create uh, a victimless crime, essentially, for two people contracting with, uh, with with someone that doesn't that isn't going to affect anybody else besides the farmers and the seed producer in in this exchange. They go into it knowing that they're not allowed to replant seed, and it's not just Monsanto, and it's not just GM crops. There are even organic and conventional seed producers that produce seeds. And in order for you to to buy seed from them, they they make you sign a contract that you don't do this. A lot of the times they don't need to because they know that it's far more easier and it's far more economically advantageous for a farmer to just re rebuy seed every time that they need to do another harvest. And so that's what they do. Um, but when you're talking in terms of Monsanto, there's a lot of R&D that goes into, just like a drug company, there's a lot of R&D that has to go into a GM crop. You have to you have to 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 do this, you know, to pay the scientists in order to produce the crop. You have to pay to test the crop. You have to pay to get over the regulatory burdens of the of the government in order to get it to be sold on, onto a market. So there's a lot of R and D costs that go into this. They could say, okay, well, if you want to replant your seed, that's fine. But instead of this bag of seed costing you, you know, a hundred dollars, it's going to cost you like. Eighty thousand dollars, because we need to make sure that that bag of 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 seed that we're going to sell you and you know the fifty other farmers, uh, just you know just this year, um, we need to make sure that we recoup all of our costs. I'm sure it's going to cost a whole lot more than eighty thousand dollars for a bag of seed if they were just to to assume that they were only going to sell one bag of seed and they're just going to replant it. So there, there, you have to have some sort of agreement. With with the, with the farmers in order to recoup your your R and D costs after a huge um, investment like that. So intellectual property. Now I'm going to state up front that I I don't view intellectual property as a, as a valid concept. Uh, intellectual property actually. I'm gonna I'm going off script here. Um, intellectual property uh, is not a valid concept. It's it's a buzz term for what was originally called intellectual monopoly um, ideas, media, things that can be copied, things that can be duplicated um, are not rivalrous goods. Meaning I have this, this cup of copy coffee, this one cup of coffee. There's only, there's only could be one person, yet, person using it at, at a time in, in theory. Uh, I'm sure like, I could I could get some other person to sip it with, through a sippy straw with me, but to the extent that this could only be generally used by one person at a time or one group of people at at a time, so therefore it's a rivalrous resources. Not everybody on earth can use my coffee cup at every particular moment, so therefore there has to be some sort of protection, some private property uh, rules or norms that we can be placed on this that cannot be placed on something in terms of ideas or um, a, you know, a digital copy of, of a particular media file, which can be distributed and be used by millions of different people all at, at different times. That's not going to affect me. So if I produce the idea of a coffee cup and everybody uses it, I'm not harmed. There's no There's no harm that's caused by someone using my idea if I invented the coffee cup. But 
that would be if someone thought if everybody in the entire world thought that they had access to my coffee cup. So intellectual property is not a valid property rights issue. Like you can't own an idea. As soon as I tell you my idea, you have my idea and you can spread it to a million different people. And the only way for me to stop that is to use some sort of initiatory force or some sort of might, some unjustified form of violence or threat of violence in order for me to you to stop me from doing that. Uh, and I don't think that's, it's, it's a very legitimate form of property rights. In, in in any in any kind of view of property rights, it's not legitimate. So that aside, I need to make that I needed to make that very clear. <laughs> so I did. Um, so yeah. So there's definitely some serious problems with IP, no doubt. I'm not advocating or defending intellectual property, as I've said before. Um, it's holy crap pro- across the board. However, most people don't subscribe to this view, and the way the world works today, it's not uh, this, my view of intellectual property is not the mainstream. It's becoming the mainstream, and I'm digging on that, but right now it is not. So, I mean, even there's even libertarians who don't agree with intellectual property, right? There's, there's always the, uh, you know, the, the o, big O objectivists. Um, like I, Ayn Rand was very much in favor of intellectual property. I know Rothbard actually tried to think of, of a, um, a libertarian version of intellectual property that wasn't particularly valid, and it, I think even he later rejected it as well. So it's very important to take that, um, take into account how Monsanto exercises its quote unquote intellectual property relative to other other uses in the market, right? Because if we're going to attack Monsanto and we're going to spend so much time attacking Monsanto, you would have to say that Monsanto might be an exception to the norm or at least worse than, than most if we're going to spend so much time talking about Monsanto specifically as compared to something like the uh, the RIAA or the MPAA, the Recording Industry of America or the, uh, the Motion Picture Association of America, why why are why is Monsanto worse than them? If we're going to spend so much time talking about it, because contrary to the widespread uh, perspective, of Monsanto is pretty good about not abusing their patents as relative to someone like the the RIAA or the MPAA. Or even worse, patent trolls, right? So let's, let's talk about this. So Monsanto does not sue organic farmers for cross-pollinization. Let me say that again. Monsanto does not sue for ant, uh, uh, accidental violations, okay? This is a myth. Um, we'll get into like one of the anti-GMO poster boys in just a bit. But before we do, I think we should talk a little bit about what Monsanto patents actually are. So Monsanto, when they patent a gene... They're not patenting the whole genome of what they created. This is also contrary to popular belief. What Monsanto, Monsanto does not have patents on life forms, and this is this is an objective, ob, objective. This is an objection people do have uh, with with uh, intellectual property in terms of uh, g- genetically modified organisms. Is that you? They don't think that it's right that you can patent a life form, but Monsanto does not. They don't do this. So when Monsanto creates a new product, let's say let's use BT cotton as an example, and they they uh, Monsanto like alters a gene to make it produce BT toxin. They only have a patent for that gene in that sequence in that crop. It's just the gene in that sequence in that crop. So to kind of give you a compare, like a kind of an example of what I mean by this, like let's say that there's a, a string of numbers that everybody uses, right? Everybody loves a string of numbers. And the number is, you know, just a 10 long number from zero to nine, you know, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And everybody uses this for various reasons for whatever. And let's say that I want to make a version of this particular string uh, and, and patent it like Monsanto would patent. Uh, like they have the user genes. I'm not saying I'm, I'm going to, this is ridiculous. This is just a thought experiment, right? This is just, just a kind of way to explain it. Um, so let's say that I wanted to, I found it a lot better if I use the same string that everybody else is using, but instead of that five that's in there, I want to change that number to an eight. So what I'm going to do Accordingly, if I'm doing this according to Monsanto, would I would not patent the string zero one two three four eight six seven eight nine. I'm not going to patent that whole string. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say I own the patent on 
in this particular sequence, so in, in this in this particular category, the, a string, a number, a ten-digit number string, I'm going to own the patent on, you know, the number five being in that sixth position, in that one, two, three, four, uh, in that zero to nine string. That I don't own that whole string, I don't own the five, uh, uh, you know, I don't own the five or the sixth number. I just just that change is what they own. So I'm like I, again, I'm not defending intellectual property or patents. I think they're, they're they you can't own these things. But this is what they're owning. So when people say like they're owning a, a, a genome, they don't. They're owning a particular altercation in that particular genome in that sequence, right? So that, that's really important. So it's it's not as sinister, you know it. it it, this is just basically just kind of it's not really it's not even really an argument against <laughs> GM crops. It's just made to sound sinister. They're owning life, but they don't really do that anyway. It's it's kind of even worthless talking about that <laughs> they really don't. But it's important to talk about it if people find it particularly persuasive. So um, so how often does this happen where Monsanto sues this poor farmer, uh, this poor innocent farmer that's done nothing wrong, or how about this? How often does Monsanto sue farmers, period? It's really not often. It's really not often. Um, and they have a financial incentive not to. Like, So if you're a farmer and you know that there's a seed company who's going to sell you seed, but you know they're super litigious, you're not going to want to do business with them. You're going to try to do as little business with them as possible because you don't want to end up losing money fighting frivolous court fees or, or frivolous court cases. It would be very financially draining on a firm that tried to do this, especially when the firm has a policy that turns all of their earnings from lawsuits over to the local communities in that person's area, including the monies that were included in the attorney's fees. So, um, yeah, so Monsanto does this. Monsanto actually loses money when they do try to sue the farmers because what ends up happening is they say, we want this amount of money for damages and we want this much money for uh, for attorney's fees. And then they take all that money and rather paying off their lawyers with it or paying off damages they, they, they incurred, they take that money and they invest it into local communities in, in that in that farmer's area, including other farmers, uh, uh, local charities that, that produce like you know, food banks and stuff like that. So these evil fuckers are are suing people so that they can give to local charities and other, you know and other farmers who you know who actually do good work in their community like how fucking dare they terrible terrible awful people so like again I, I i'm not for i'm not advocating for state sanctioned violence for sure i'm not but what i'm saying is if you're looking at it from the perspective of these are terrible people who are just suing people to put money in their own pockets it's just factually inaccurate and it wouldn't be a very good business model even if they were to try to take money and put it into their pockets from from farmers because you don't it doesn't just because I sue someone for money doesn't necessarily I'm going to mean I'm going to get the money <laughs> like you could still there's other things around I think you can actually file for bankruptcy in some some cases but let's talk about how often this happens because it's actually very rare so since about I think roughly the year 2000 or so Monsanto has sued sued about I think this number has may have changed I'm looking at the numbers from 2015. Um, so since two, you know, from the year 2000 to the year 2015, there's been about 148 farmers that have been sued by Monsanto. Only 12 of those actually gone to trial. And of those 12, only four has actually been adjudicated. And of those four, they've all went in Monsanto's favor. Monsanto has only sued people and they only try to sue people if it's a clear violation of the patent, you either signed an agreement with Monsanto and you replanted seeds as a violation of that of that contract. Woo, contract! Yeah, sorry, I had to. Hi, um, <laughs> but you know, as as a violation of that contract, which they which they knowingly get into, and it's one of the big provisions that is made very clear to them, and that they agree to. So they either do that, or they'll sue um, they'll sue a farmer who may notice that okay, this farmer over here uses. Um, BT cotton, and I want to be able to use glyphosate in my fields, but I don't want to have to be involved in Monsanto's contracts. So what I'll do is I'll go and buy seed from a from a local f uh, store here that I know that are getting them from the the BT cotton seed over here, 
you know, that's used for livestock feed. And then I'll just plant those. And, you know, Monsanto will go and check and be like, yeah, that this is all of our, uh, this is all of our DNA. <laughs> like this is not possible for whatever. And then they'll sue them for that. Um, what they will not sue for, what they will not sue for is cross pollinization. If Monsanto comes onto your comes onto your field, if you're a farmer, and they and they test your crops, and they're saying like, yeah, there's like one over here that looks to be ours, um, you know, but most of them are. There's a couple here and there that kind of share similar traits. This looks like a, maybe a little bit of cross pollination. Maybe some seed flew over from from a nearby truck or something. It doesn't look like a, a, like that's the case. They will not sue them. What they will sue is if the vast majority of your crops are GM crops and they have evidence to show that you purposely file and knowingly violated that contract. That's what they do. Uh, if, if it's not there, they don't find it particularly advantageous because again, they lose money every time that they sue because all the winnings uh, are often not are often 100% of the time are, are used to go back into the community. There's also been cases, and we're going to talk about one in particular, the poster boy, where they just don't even sue for money. They just say, stop doing it. And they'll just use the, the, the court case to, to get an injunction to prevent them from, from pl- replanting those seeds again. Uh, so anytime this is brought up, anytime you talk about Monsanto's lit- litigious nature and you try to say like that doesn't happen, this is the one example that is guaranteed to be brought up. And that's a guy by the name of Percy Smizer. So Percy Smizer was a Canadian canola farmer who had some cross-pollinization, allegedly, had some cross-pollinization from Roundup Ready canola in his crop or rape seeds. Uh, the evil Monsanto tested his field and found out that there's some of their genes was found in his field. Now, and and they went and sued them and it was a big thing. It was, and there was even some, some films about it like called, I think it was like, uh, Percy versus or David versus uh, Monsanto, you know, kind of hinting David versus Goliath. Um, this is patently untrue. This is this is the most bullshit fucking story that has ever been told, and everybody still swears by it. You can go and pull up the court case yourself and read the verdict yourself, and read some of the testimony that Percy Smizer made in court, and you quickly realize this guy is a total charlatan. So I'm gonna be reading from. Uh, a Reason Magazine article from 2001 about this because it does explain this very, thir- very thoroughly. So this is reading from um, uh, Reason Magazine. The case arose from Mon- Monsanto acting on a tip sent to private investigators to test canola growing in Smurzy's 900-acre farm in two- uh, 1997. The tip suggested that Schmeiser might be growing Monsanto- Monsanto's genetically enhanced variety of Roundup Ready canola uh, seeds that resist Monsanto's herbicide Roundup. The benefit of the crop, farmers say that they can spray, uh, they can kill weeds without harming their canola crop. Before selling the Roundup Ready seeds to farmers, Monsanto requires them to sign a license to use the seeds and to sign a technology use agreement, a TUA. These agreements require that farmers using Monsanto seeds sell their crops to approved grain merchants and that they not have these seeds replanted. About 40% of all canola grown in Canada is Roundup Ready, and some 20,000 Canadian farmers have signed the Monsanto licensing agreements. In 1997, Schmeiser refused to allow Monsanto investigators to sample his crops, so they acquired samples from a public road uh, right-of-ways, which Schmeiser had planted some canola. Uh, these samples were tested, and 100%, 100% of them were found to be resistant to, uh, to Roundup. Monsanto obtained samples from a local mill that had cleaned out the 1997 seeds Schmeiser saved for replanting. I'm take a drink here. The samples were tested at a university of, uh, at the University of Manitoba, and 95 to 98 percent were Roundup ready. That range is uh, evidence. Uh, excuse me. Quote: The range is evidence that the pre- uh, the presence of commercial Roundup ready canola. The court ruled. Eventually. The court ordered Schmeiser to allow Monsanto investigators to sample his 1998 crop. The, the test found that the presence of the patented gene in a range of eight, uh, 95 to 80 percent of the canola sampled. 
Smizer does not deny that much of the canola growing on his farm in 1997 and in 1998 did not uh, the, did in fact contain Monsanto's Roundup Ready gene, but he claims that it got there via cross-pollinization by winds and bees. Getting off script here. This is not what he argued in court, by the way. Uh, seed blowing off uh, or um, seed blowing off passing on grain trucks or from seed um, blown by wind onto his property from other farmers' land. Since he didn't ask for the gene to appear on his property, Smyzy argued that he shouldn't be held liable for infringing Monsanto's patent. In fact, he countered that Monsanto should be held responsible for controlling the genes that he let loose into the environment. But as often occurs, court cases turn into uh, turn on particular facts. First, the expert testimony accepted that the court explained that the cross uh, that mere cross pollinization could not produce a canola crop that was 95 percent Roundup ready. Secondly, in 1996, when he alleged that the cross-pollinization would have occurred, the nearest farmer licensed to use Roundup Ready canola was five miles away. Third, the, an expert in the road vehicle aerodynamic te uh, testified that canola seed falling from a passing truck would have traveled no more than 8.8 .8 meters. Furthermore, Schmeiser claimed that he used other herbicides to control weed in his fields, including Teferon, Munster, and Assure. Uh, I'm probably not saying that right. Uh, in 1997 and 1998, he could produce no receipts that show that he had purchased those chemicals. However, he did have receipts that showed that he had bought Roundup. Finally, a neighboring farmer had testified that Schmeiser hired uh, that Schmeiser's hired hand had told him several times that Schmeiser had grown Roundup Brady canola and that he had sprayed Roundup on the crop. The court concluded that it did not matter how Roundup Ready got uh, into Schmeiser's farm and that the salient point is that he specifically saved, saved seed he knew was tolerant of Roundup. Schmeiser's, quote, infringement, of rises, uh, infringement arises not simply from occasional or limited contamination of Roundup susceptible by canola by, um, canola by plants that are Roundup resistant. He uh, planted his crop in 1998 with seed he knew that or ought to know that uh, had hadn't had Roundup Ready tolerance. Unquote. Thus, he owned a user fee and uh, shared some of the profit from his 1998 crop. Which, by the way, when the final ruling did come down, he ended up not having to pay Monsanto a cent. They just basically told him he couldn't patent it anymore. And he never actually made these claims in the actual court case when it went to the Supreme Court because he knew that he would be perjuring himself if he did. Um, so when people talk about the Percy Smizer case, it's it's kind of funny because they just rely on his testimony and they don't actually read the testimony or any of the court cases. And he did lose. And it's kind of funny that they, they'll, they'll allege that he won. He didn't win. He fucking lost. But anyways. Oh. So let's talk about there was another lawsuit that happened and this often gets brought up. And it's funny because people don't actually read what happened regarding this lawsuit as well. Um, so there was, uh, in 2011, um, the public patent, the public patent foundation filed claim. I think a lot of this I'm actually reading from uh, Wikipedia. Yeah. Yeah. This is Wikipedia. So this is from the Monsanto lawsuits, uh, Wikipedia page in 2011, the public patent foundation filed claims in the Southern district of New York, challenging the validity of 23 of Monsanto's patents on genetically modified seed on behalf of the organic seed growers Tra and trade association and 82 other farming associations of the group. They contended they were being forced to sue preemptively to protect themselves from being accused of patent infringement. Should their uh, fields ever be contaminated by Monsanto's genetically modified seed Monsanto moved for dismissal, citing a public public pledge that it made not to quote exercise its patent rights where trace amounts were being uh were uh, excuse me quote where exercise of its patent rights were uh, were trace amounts of our patented seeds or traits are being present in farmers fields as a result as uh, as a result of inadvertent means unquote the district court judge Naomi Bershwald dismissed the lawsuit in 2012 and criticized the plaintiffs plaintiffs uh, in order for a, quote, transparent effort to create a controversy where none exists, unquote. In June 2013, a federal uh, circuit uh, affirmed the district court's decision and the, discre the, dis uh, the, discre 
the Supreme Court declined to hear an appeal in January 2014. So what happened was they, believing some of the, the anti-GMO you know, propaganda movies, thought that Monsanto, falsely, thought, thought that Monsanto sued people for cross-pollinization, which there is no evidence that they did, and they couldn't provide evidence in this court case. They tried to sue Monsanto preemptively as, as kind of a defense mechanism, but the problem was that there was no evidence whatsoever to show that their claims were even valid whatsoever because Monsanto doesn't do what they were alleging, alleging of doing. So they're trying to preemptively sue, which is, is ridiculous, first of all. Secondly, you know, they're trying, to, they're trying to do it based on an urban legend, which is ridiculous. So um, here's where it gets fun. So we're going to be talking about some of the studies that kind of uh, get, get kind of lumped in since – we kind of went through most of the other stuff, and I'm sure there's a whole lot of other stuff that, I, that I'm not going to be able to cover uh, in this particular episode. S- um, but I wanted to kind of cover most of the big ones. And we're going to be talking, and then we're not going to be able to cover all of the anti-GMO uh, ones, but we're going to be talking about the big ones and the one major one that, uh, that we'll, we'll get into the details of that, which is really important. Um, that kind of people bring up whenever this whole topic comes comes arise because it's always these three or four studies that people always uh, bring up all the time. And uh, right after I get done with the uh, the French rat study, then I'm going to be wrapping up this particular take, and then I'll be adding on uh, another take where I, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the notes that I haven't completely written out yet. But I just wanted to get this done and out of the way so that there's something here. <laughs> so, uh, like again, so I'm not going to be editing this. So, um, the Australian pig uh, pig feed study. This is one that gets kind of brought up. It's not as popular as the French rat study, but this is one that gets brought up, and it's really kind of easy to kind of go through because this is one of the most ridiculous ones that get brought up. Um, there's another one that was brought up to me by Dave Painter of Seeds of Liberty, which all I did was just go, okay, uh, this is not a peer reviewed study. <laughs> so I don't like it didn't pass peer review. So I was not even going to try to even bother wasting my time with it. Uh, it was just basically published on a, on a crank website. <laughs> and this, this one is too, uh, but this one is the one that gets brought up a whole lot more. That one was more of a fringe study. Uh, so this is the Australian pig f- study, a.k.a. a long-term toxicity study on pigs fed a combined genetically modified GM soy and GM maize diet. Um, this study is, like I said, the worst thing ever um, in, in terms of it purports to be the worst thing ever in terms of like, oh, look how bad GM is. But actually, it's just the worst study ever ever produced that I've ever seen. Uh, so you don't need any kind of scientific understanding whatsoever to know how bullshit the study is. Oh, I'm sorry. There was a cat outside. <laughs> I was like, is that my cat? No. All right. So um, anyway, sorry about that. So, um, yeah, so you can just read it yourself and just go like, wow, this study is full of shit. Even if you want to believe that it's true, it's hard to walk away from this paper after reading it and going like, well, this is legitimate. No, there's no way you can do it. So let's kind of go over some of the huge problems with this paper. There's a lot of them, but this is the big ones that kind of show you how stupid this is. Uh, Again, if you if you have passed this study on to someone, I highly encourage you to actually read the full monograph of the of this uh of this of this text and then then try to tell me that you think it's legitimate and, and try to justify it but the, here's the big problems with it so number one it was never published in a reputable journal which means that it's it wasn't properly peer-reviewed in fact it wasn't peer-reviewed at all at all it was just published in some 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 organic trade journal thing Secondly, it lies about its conflict of interest. The study was produced by a company that makes organic feeds and foods, and it says it has no conflicts of interest. Three, it uses imperial units instead of SI units, which means that the study was published not for the scientific community, but for the general public in the United States specifically, because they don't use imperial units uh, overseas. It's usually just an American thing. I think some other countries use imperial still. But normally when they do tests, they use SI units. That's that way that it's universal across all uh, all of the world so that they can all use 
the, the same measurements and there's not a lot of confusion. Four, the control group was contaminated with GM crops, with GM food. Yeah, so the control group was contaminated. The, the, the group that was supposed to have no GM had GM food, and they even admit this in the paper. Five, they determined that inflammation of the stomachs, uh, they determined whether or not there was inflammation in the stomachs, rather, by just looking at them and making a visual judgment. You can't do that. You just you can't just look at it and just go, oh, that's inflammation. No, you need to have it tested in the lab. But that doesn't matter. We'll get into why in just a second. The pictures used in the um, the pictures used in the published pa- paper were the worst looking stomachs from the GM group and the best looking stomachs from the control group to make it look worse than it actually was. And by the way, there's no there's no like legitimate. Well, I guess if you're looking at it visually, I guess it does matter. Um, but normally when when there's pictures taken in a scientific study, that should be a huge red flag to anybody because there's no real scientific merit to 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 kind of like, oh, look at look at the size of the stomach or look at the size of this rat's tumor. Um, they said that, uh, that in the control group, they had inflammated stomachs according to whatever bullshit metrics that they used, but they blamed it on contamination. So they they admitted in the picture that they that they used the best the better looking stomachs for the pictures and that the worst looking stomachs for the pictures for the ones that they want to give a perception to so the control group had the nice looking pretty stomachs and, and the the uh the group that they wanted to demonize the gm crops they used the worst looking ones and then they justified not showing the the ones that looked the same in, in other fields because that was just a cause of contamination and they admitted this in the paper. But none of that matters because number five is the, the death nail. Um, when they slaughtered the pigs, the pigs were sick. All of them. The control group, the GM crop group, uh, the GM fed pigs, they were all sick at the time of the slaughter. So, of course, this is going to have inflammation. Why was this test even done? I, I don't even know why this test was even published. It, everything leading up to this should have gotten the paper dismissed out of hand. Like, you've had a contamination. Try the test again. You're cherry-picking pictures. Show us all the pictures. This should be thrown out. On top of that, wait, you, you the pigs were sick. And then you took the pictures, then you slaughtered them and took pictures of them? Come on. Like, do you even science, bro? Like, I don't, I don't even science, bro. And I'm like, do you even science, bro? <laughs> this is just fucking stupid. So let's talk about another one. So this is the hemotoxicity of bacteria gorillas. Again, I don't think any human can actually pronounce that thing. In spore crystal strains, cry 1A, cry 1B, blah, 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 in Swiss albino mice. Now, this one is pretty simple. This one's really simple to kind of refute. So we can delve into some of the the failings for which the paper has, which there are many, but we won't because I'm not a scientist. Uh, I don't purport to be a scientist. Um, What really matters is this paper is not about BT toxin and GM crops. This paper is about bacteria BT. So they're trying to prove that there's problems in, in, in you know with with humans ingesting bt bacteria but not g uh, bacteria crops and th- in the paper as well they try to make the claim that oh well this has everything to do with the toxin that it produces uh you know that's only toxic for these particular classes of animals but it also i guess now there's toxicity proven in humans but they don't actually make the correlation between is it the toxin is it some other thing that the bacteria produces because the bacteria produces other things or is it the bacteria themselves that does damage? Like they never make that claim clear and they never try to explain why. Um, but it doesn't matter because it's about the bacteria and not the GM crystalline proteins that come from the tox, uh, from the BT cotton or BT corn rather. So if you eat organic food, you should be very concerned if you take this study legitimately. I would not. But if but if you eat organic food because they're the ones that are using the BT bacteria, not GM. All right. So this one is a little bit more scientific. And I'm going to do some 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 kind of explanation about it. But um, but this is the, the WHO study that that often gets cited as well. 
So in May 2015, a body within the World Health Organization called the International Agency for Research on Cancer, or the IARC, declared that glyphosate, the key ingredient in Roundup, was probably carcinogenic, quote unquote, probably carcinogenic, and that people are now using this, especially at March, March against Monsanto protests, as proof that this is causing uh, cancer in humans. Now, there's a lot of problems with it. First of all, this is not a peer-reviewed study. This is supposed to be an analysis of, of, of works that they've investigated and they've come to the conclusion. Now, this, this paper also stands in contrast to the 2006 study that they, or not study, but uh, analysis of the studies that they looked into, which said that glyphosate was okay. Um, and this is a really, really terrible paper, and we're going to get into it a little bit more. I highly recommend that you check out Miles Powers video on this. He has a video called glyphosate and the video is titled glyphosate quote, probably carcinogenic to humans, unquote, question mark. If you look for that guaranteed, you'll find it. His name is Miles Powers. If you don't know about him, you should really check out his channel because it's really good. It's a really good science channel. It's a really good science channel. Um, the, Miles is a professional uh, scientist uh, outside of his YouTube channel and he's worth a watch. He really is worth a watch. Uh, so I'm just going to kind of go over these mildly uh, if you really want to get into more depth i highly recommend watching this video on that i've said that a million times now so basically there's four claims being made in this paper uh, the first claim is that in male mice glyphosate induced a positive trend in a uh in, in <laughs> an incidence of a rare tumor uh renal tubular carcinoma the problem with this claim is that besides the the weasel word of a positive trend normally scientists will say like a significantly uh what is it like a, a significant trend, right? Um, is that when, okay. So besides that weasel word, um, when, uh, the control group of mice, they, um, so these mice had like, uh, okay, sorry. I'm, I'm not going to fucking edit this thing. So the problem with this claim is besides the weasel wording of the positive trend is that when a control group mice, they chalked it up to uh, just a random chance as in one of 700 developed these tumors naturally. But with the glyphosate uh, rate, they got the same same pretty much statistical chance of, of them getting the same thing. So they had these mice and they had a statistical uh chance of getting this kind of tumor and i think it was one in 700 yeah 107 mice got this tumor and when it happened in the the control group they chalked it up to uh, oh that was just a statistical chance they would get it but when the same statistical odds showed themselves into this into the study they chalked it up to oh but this is proof that this was glyphosate um no that's not how it works. And it also kind of conflicts with two more recent studies that were also submitted to the WHO that, uh, that were critical of those results, and which is interesting is that they cited those in the 2006 paper, but they omitted them in the current paper. So they have this older study that they brought up that, that come to that weird, stupid conclusion that they used, and they, they discounted the two more recent studies that came out afterwards critical of that study. That's that's not very that's not very good science, buddy. Uh, claim number two: Glyphosate increased pancreatic insulate cell edema in male rats in two studies. Now, in the monograph, uh, in the monograph, it says that there was no significantly, uh, statistically significant positive trends, right, uh, with with these tumors in rats. So, why are they reporting that it does in the WHO report? The, the, these are consistent with the historical spontaneity of these tumors, according to the study that they are citing for proof that is not spontaneity. Like in the study, it says that there's the <laughs> that you know that like there's no difference between what would, this would happen naturally versus what we got from the test group. So why are they even report like they didn't even? I don't even think they even read the report. I think they just kind of looked at it and said like, oh look, these groups got cancer. Let's not actually read the entire thing. That's just all we need. Just put that there. Claim number three is that a glyphosate formulation promoted in skin tumors in an ice. Uh, in a, some of these kind of weird, like they're really weird titles for these claims. So a um, a glyphosate formulation promoted in skin tumors in an uh, initiation promotion study in mice, which means they're trying to test whether or not just being exposed to it, not ingesting it, but just being exposed to it can cause cancer. Um 
Now, this study was not about if glyphosate was a carcinogen, carcinogen, but rather if glyphosate can act as a promoter of a carcinogen. So if there's like a carcinogen and you have glyphosate in your body or, or in, in mixed in with it, will it make uh, the cancer more likely to happen in your body because of the glyphosate? Not because glyphosate is a cancer uh, carcinogen, which the WHO paper is trying to make that claim. Uh, but rather, it could be a promoter. So if if you come in contact with carcinogens, could that promote it? Uh, but here's the problem from the monograph, quote, the glyphosate formulation tested appeared to be a tumor promoter in the study. The design of the study was poor with short duration of treatment, so uh, no solvent controls and a small number of rats and a lack of histo uh, histopathological examination. The working group concluded that this was an inadequate study for the evaluation of glyphosate. So what it's saying is, is that, it, that the study was completely flawed and there's no real valid things that you can get from the study whatsoever and it needs to be redone. And even still, like, it's, not, it's not even proof of what the paper is trying or what the World Health Organization is trying to claim is that it's a carcinogen. This, even if this paper was true, it's not proving that it does. It would show that there was a, there's a problem with it for sure, but it doesn't prove what they're trying to set out to claim. Like this is not proof of that, you know. Uh, and even, even still, the, 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 the paper is bullshit. And claim number four, there's limited, uh, limited evidence uh, in humans for the carcinogenity of glyphosate. Now, limited is an understatement, to say the least. Uh, this is based on three studies cited in the Lancet press release, which were uh, that was misreported by the press release. These studies were, in very, uh, were very limited in what they were looking at. Um, and there have been other studies that have looked into this claim specifically. They're cherry-picked and cherry-picked poorly. At least according to the author of the Colombian study that was cited, so the author had read this report and issued a statement saying, quote, when we looked at the differences between uh, uh, the, the macronuclei between those two groups, we found that there was no difference, he said, and that they, the I IARC, got this totally wrong. The, they said the study showed that there was a relationship it was certainly a different conclusion than the one that we came to, unquote. Basically, the too long didn't listen version of this whole thing is that the, w, uh, the WHO misrepresented limited the limited studies that they had cited, ignored lots of stu uh, studies um, that showed data to the contrary. This is not how science is done. You don't get to cherry pick bad studies and misreport those studies and come to a conclusion. That's what we call quackery. But then again, you know, what do you expect? It's from a UN body. So the last one before I, uh, I close this one out and then I, I finish uh, finishes uh, this podcast out uh, with, with some of the some of the other things I want to add to this. Let's talk about the one that everybody loves to bring up, and that's the French rat study, a.k.a. long term study or long term toxicity of a Roundup herbicide and a Roundup tolerant GM maize. Now, this is the one that still makes the rounds because. This is the only one that was actually peer reviewed, the only one that was actually peer reviewed and submitted to a reputable journal. Uh, unfortunately, it was also condemned and pulled from the literature, literature for being completely fraudulent. So what was wrong with the study? Um, well, let's ignore that the authors, the, the lead author of this paper didn't mention in, in the uh, in the section regarding um, conflicts of interest that he was working with an anti GMO lobby. Um, but let's just talk about specifically what's wrong with the data in this thing. So there are some big problems with this thing. First of all, the study used 100 male rats and 100 female uh, albino sprague, sprague dowley. How am I saying that right? Sprague dowley rats. Uh, they divided the, 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 them into 10 groups for each sex. So there's the 200 rats, 100 female, 100 male. Uh, and they group each of those sexes into 10 different groups, 20 different groups in all, male, female. And uh, so one group was fed uh, a standard maize diet and water, no GM, no, no glyphosate. And three groups were fed in various amounts of 11 percent, 22 percent and 33 percent uh, percent uh, maize maize that was treated with Roundup. The final three groups were fed uh, standard maize 
without GM, but were given various levels of Roundup contaminated water. Uh, 50% of the male rats and 75% of the female rats died prematurely when exposed to the GM Roundup treated water, compared to 30% male and 20% female in the control group. The first problem was very clear when I was describing this, uh, is that the sample size is way too small. They're testing how many things they're testing. Okay. So they're testing, um, a control group. That's one. They're testing three different, (laughs) three different uh, levels of, uh, GM maze. And then they're testing three groups or no, no, six groups. (laughs) Shit. (laughs) So, So six groups, so they have 10 different groups for each different group. So there's a total of 20 groups for 200 rats and only 10 rats in each group. So yeah, like this is this is not something that you can really test for. This is way too many things that they're testing for. Um, 10 rats per group per sex and the control group is only 10 as well. How could you extrapolate any data from that? That's that's not it's that's a really small sample size. Like any kind of statistical flaw would show itself up as big. So if you have one extra rat who, that's statistically like an anomaly, that would show that you know you have a ten percent increase in 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 uh, in mortality. That's that's it's crazy. You need to at, at least a hundred per group. At least hundred per group. You, know, you got to narrow those things down. Second problem is that the spag 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 dolly. Spag Dolly rat. I kind of. I think I said it right the first time. Um, <laughs> I was talking about it. The Spag Dolly rat is known for spontaneously developing tumors without assistance from glyphos- uh, glyphosate or GM corn, and even higher rates than what the French rat study reported, uh, which can be explained because of the small sample size, of course, um, and that the females had this problem far worse, almost double that of males. See the study. The study that I'm referring to is called spont. Uh, Spontaneous tumors in the Spaug Deli rats and Swiss mice. So this is the thing that really pisses me off about this study. And then I'm going to wrap this particular cut out and then I'm going to add uh, the, whatever. I think I've already explained that enough. Um, what really makes me sick about this fucking study is that they waited and let these rats suffer this tumor issue that they have until their body mass was 25% tumor. Like... And the only reason why they would do this was to just to take pictures of those rats. Like there was no, there's no scientific reason why you would show a picture of rats that are mostly tumors. Like there was no fucking reason for that whatsoever besides to just take a picture that you, so that you can elicit an emotional response from people who are scientifically illiterate because there's no like scientific re- uh, data that you can conclude from this. Now, the other problem with this study is that it showed like these graphs and, and the graphs were in black and white. The pictures were color, but the graphs were in black and white. And you basically had to kind of like follow the thickness or the thinness of the line in order to kind of notice any kind of po- uh, trend. And they did this on purpose. They made it really kind of hard to follow these, these graphs because there's no real statistical data that you can draw from this. There's no, there was no correlation between these things. So they try to keep it. As, as you know, like they try to keep the mess that they created as hidden as possible by creating an even bigger mess with these graphs. So you can kind of look at them and ignore them and move right along. And it's kind of interesting because there is one trend that you can definitely follow if you were to take this thing is that if you're a, if you're a male rat and you want to live longer and you want to to beat the odds of cancer you should start putting Roundup in your water. If you're going to take this to the logical conclusion that that were you to um, to f- take the study literally and, and, and apply it into your own life, the best thing you can do if you're a male is to add glyphosate to your water because glyphosate, according to this thing, has a trend of reducing the risk of cancer. That's you have to come away from that conclusion. And I don't see how you can look at the, at the paper and, and come not come to that conclusion, because that's the only trend that's visible from any of these groups whatsoever. It's the only one you could possibly walk away from. And of course, 
they would say that's ridiculous, right? Because they want to use this paper to show that glyphosate is terrible, all right? And drinking glyphosate is not going to be good for you. It's, it's not a good idea to put glyphosate Roundup in your water. It's, it's, it's probably going to be a bad idea, even, even in small doses, right? It, it's, it's not recommended. Um, if it's on your, if it's on your plant, you can wash it off, whatever. It's, it's not going to be a, a big, that big of a deal and that low of a quality, but adding it to your water, it's probably a bad idea. But according to this study, you know, if you're a male, it's a good idea to do that because it'll reduce your chances of cancer according to the study, which is bullshit. So I'm going to wrap this one up. And we'll move on to some uh, one other. I think I have one other study and, and a couple more things that I want to talk to, uh, at least about um, intellectual property and, and that sort of matter. So we'll we'll see when once I finish my notes. Uh, pre, uh, this is a preemptive worms. All right, so I'm back. Um, how about this? Let's just wrap up some more common myths that are going around GMOs and Monsanto, and then we'll wrap this up. Um, so let's talk about labeling. Um, labeling might be a good idea, or this is, this is, this is my straw man of you. Okay. <laughs> For those of you who disagree with me, um, labeling might be a good idea because you don't actually know what, uh, what could have a GM in there. And there's nothing to wrong if it, if it's just a label, right? Like why would you be against informed consumers? Um, first of all, no, GM labeling is not about consumer choice or knowledge. Uh, it's a wedge issue to get it banned. If you go to the store and you haven't heard of any of the arguments for or against uh, GM crops and you see a warning label on there saying, warning, this product may contain genetically modified crops. Ooh, it sounds spooky and scary and people are going to avoid it. But the goal of this is not, like I said, it's not about that. It's about banning. If you go and you look up a lot of these thought leaders that are very anti-GMO, who are the leaders of this kind of movement, they are very open and very public about their uh, support of labeling as a means to get uh, a universal ban on genetically modified foods. Because the goal is not about informa information, it's about scaring people. Because it's not hard, if, you, if, you, if you're against GMOs, and you want to avoid GMOs, it's not hard to do. Um, it's really not hard to avoid them. Currently, at the time of this recording, there are only eight crops that are commercially available for the uh, <clears throat> in the U.S. that are genetically modified, which is corn, field and sweet, cotton, canola, sugar beets, papaya, alfalfa, squash, and just recently they just approved the Arctic apple and the innate potato. So if it doesn't contain any of these ingredients, it's not GM. So you, while I've I've heard people complain like, well, I don't know if these these really spicy peppers are genetically modified. They're fucking not. They don't have any of them. That <laughs> I wish there was some genetically modified hot pepper. I really do, because that would be amazing. It would it would make the Carolina Reaper have a run for its money. Um. But yeah, sure. Okay, so what if there's like a GM crop being fed to to a chicken or a pig, and then I'm buying the pork, and there's GM in it? Ooh, well, I don't see how that would be a, a necessarily a problem. Um, considering one, you're going to cook it, and two, it's no, nothing that's inside of that stuff is going to survive the fires of their stomachs. But let's just say that it does. Um, it's really simple. It's really simple. Uh, there's two things you can check. One, there's a uh, a, a, I guess an organization called uh, the Project GMO, which labels and informs people that there are no GM products in certain things. And you'll see it. It'll say like, you know, Project GMO certified, no no GMO. In fact, I think I have a bag of chips. No, I do, throw it away. <laughs> Sorry. But yeah, there, there's a little label that you can find. It's on most stuff. You can't miss it. They even put it on like shit, like pink Himalayan salt. Salt does not have genes. It can't be modified. You fucking idiots. Anyways. Um, and then the other way of telling is just buying certified organic stuff. In the United States, it is illegal to say something is organic if it contains genetically modified uh, foods in, in, in any of it. That's one of the requirements to have the label legally to have the label organic in the United States. So if there's clear ways to avoid to avoid GM products. On a voluntary basis, why are people pushing for a mandated genetically modified uh, food label law? Why? 
because this has nothing to do with consumer knowledge. It has nothing to do with consumer knowledge. It, it's it's just a way to push a wedge in and to scare people into supporting a full out ban. Well, Jim, there's like 20 other countries where it's banned. I mean, clearly they can't all be wrong, but okay, well, there's like 189 countries or something along those lines that have banned marijuana. I guess that's hazardous too. I know the United States wanted to, to ban Kratom for a while, and it wasn't until they had an outpouring of of um, support for Kratom that they actually uh, rescind it, and, and now they're reviewing it. They may make it illegal again. We don't know. Australia has banned it as well. I mean, clearly that stuff must be hugely toxic, right? Look, politicians are really good about playing off political expediency. If they know they can get a few votes by pushing for some crank bullshit, they will, even if they even if they don't even believe in it. Well, ex Monsanto employees, they work for the FDA. I mean, that's corporate fascism, Jim. I thought you were against fascism. Uh, well, first of all, I don't support this. Um, just because someone had a job somewhere and they now have a position of power doesn't mean that they still have loyalties to their previous employer. Right. You need to prove that there's still a, a connection there. Right. There's lots of politicians that probably worked for McDonald's when they were growing up. Do they do you think they still have a, the last job that you had? Do you have any loyalties to that job? Are you feeding them information from your new job? No, you're not. Probably not. OK, just because you worked at a place doesn't necessarily mean you still have loyalties there. there that is a thing. I'm not denying that is a thing, but you just can't just automatically just jump to that as somehow it's proof that it's true. And look, I, I, I'm totally against the, the, the whole corporate play thing, the whole corporate play in government where, you know, people go, you know, have a revolving door where they where they start working for a company. They'll leave and go work for the government. And like, look, I'm independent and then come right back out and get their old job back at their old firm. Like, clearly there was. There was some sort of sort sort of dynamic going on there for sure. I'm not going to deny that, but at the same time, you can't say that Monsanto is the problem and then ignore the exact same kind of revolving door that happens with the organic food food market that happens in all of these industries. We'll get into that in just a little bit, but you you can't ignore you you can't just look at Monsanto and say they're the bad guy and then just allow the the organic farmers uh, unions and the companies and the agro firms because these are multi-billion dollar industries as well it's not like monsanto is the biggest the biggest player in the agro game they're really not i mean they're, they're actually small fry that's why they got bought out by bayer not too long ago right and what do they make aspirin So, so why don't they get the same scrutiny? Like, why don't organic farmers get the same scrutiny that everybody else does when they when they have a, when they have a relationship with government? Well, hi, you just admitted that you wouldn't drink glyphosate, Jim. If it's so harmless, why not? Like, I went over this, but I, I feel that it's important to kind of rehash this because I know there's going to be some fuckface who's going to say this <laughs> again. Uh, the dose makes the poison. The dose makes the poison. The LD50, okay? The LD50 is the lethal dose which, which occurs of a 50% survival rate. They usually put this in MDMS sheets uh, on all chemicals that kind of tell you, like, this is the lethal dose. You know, don't, don't let you, don't ingest any more than this. The lethal dose for glyphosate is 5,600 milligrams per kilogram, which is 25 times or so less toxic than caffeine. But yet we we die to get that stuff put in our bodies. Again, just because salt is good for you and it's, it's a necessary mineral for your body to survive doesn't mean you should go and eat an entire box of it. You know, so if if glyphosate and all these these herbicides that they use are so so uh, so healthy and fine, how come they wear like hazmat suits? Like they they do the same thing for a lot of organic farming as well. Look, again, the dose makes a poison. And I remember when I was um when I was a kid, and there was a Terminex guy spraying, and he had like you know. He didn't have a you know a hazmat suit on, but he was wearing a you know, long sleeve like uniform, um, boots, gloves. Uh, goggles, hat, um, you know, gas mask, and he was spraying the stuff. And we were outside because I used to smoke cigarettes back then. 
and we were outside smoking and he was out spraying and he he was just kind of spraying like haphazardly around us or whatever and we were like, whoa, like, is, is that stuff okay for us to be like, spraying around? Because, you know, look at what you're wearing. And he just took all that stuff off and kept spraying the rest of the house and was like, no, look, like, I work with this stuff all day, every day. And because I work with it all day, every day, I get, I'm, I get constant prolonged exposure at high volumes of this stuff. That could be a problem for anybody. If I spray this near you, or, you know, if it's some spilt on me or something like that, just one time, it's not going to be a big deal. And that kind of gave me a, a big life lesson. It's again, it's it's the dose that makes the poison. Farmers like live and breathe farming. They live on their farm. They're there all the time, almost 100 percent of the time. So they're constantly having to deal with these pesticides and chemicals, whether it's conventional or whether it's GMO, or whatever. They're not going to go out and, 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 and put themselves as exposure uh, with their bare skins and their bare mouth, especially if they're living with this stuff and they have to deal with this stuff all the time. It's just a safety precaution. If they didn't, anything, almost nearly anything would be a problem. Again, eat a box of salt. But what about colony collapse disorder, right? Like, you know that Einstein said that, you know, we'd all die if it wasn't for the bee, right? Well, first of all, just because Einstein said something doesn't necessarily make it true, right? Because he also said that socialism is supreme over capitalism or some bullshit like that. Uh, but th there's some truth to this this B thing. But I, I can't stand when people say, like, well, Einstein said the definition of insanity. Well, he didn't say that, and even if he did, that's he's not he's not a clinical psychologist. You know, he doesn't really he doesn't really have room to speak on that issue. But um, so the problem that there's there's no there's no connection between genetically modified foods and colony dis collapse disorder, and it seems as though colony collapse disorder is on the uh, is on a steep decline now. Uh, it doesn't seem like it's going to be a problem, and beekeepers have kind of figured out ways of uh, mitigating their 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 colonies from dying off. You know, they have a financial incentive to figure this stuff out, and they figured this stuff out. And in fact, I think there, I read an article not too long ago that said that there's more bee colonies today than there was when they first started announcing that this this uh, CCD uh, issue was kind of taking hold. You guys need to stay up with the news, I guess. But Jim, you've been bought off by Monsanto. No, I, I wish. I wish. If, if I was, I wouldn't sit here and be like, oh, please donate. Hashtag please donate, by the way. But let me ask you, dear straw man, um, since you're sitting here and accusing me of having all these ill intentions for a, a position, a you know, a public position that I hold, right? And you're allowed to ascribe to me like ill intentions for my position. Why can't I accuse you for wanting the deaths of anywhere from a quarter to a million to half a million children in places like uh, Asia, Southern Asia, uh, because organizations like Greenpeace go out and stop people from growing golden rice and lobby governments to stop to ban golden rice or to go out and destroy fields of golden rice. So golden rice is a GM crop that was developed by a, a group of different uh, uh, biotech firms, not not just Monsanto. I don't even think Monsanto was involved in this. I have to check. But it's not just by Monsanto. It was created by a group. They made the licensing uh, fee $0.00. And they grant it to for free to any any kind of subsistence farmers, and and they often will pay for for people to grow this stuff. And there's a reason why. One is because they want to kind of help with the food shortage in that area. But on top of that, there's a vitamin A deficiency in that area. It's not found in the local cuisine. And so what they did is they figured out a way to get the endosperm to create vitamin A inside of the rice. So they don't have to learn how to create new crops. They don't have to get new infrastructure to learn how to, how to grow like carrots or something like that. They can just eat their normal cuisine, something that they're used to, something the, a flavor palette that they're very fond of. They have the infrastructure to grow it, and it has the ability to be stored like any other grain because you can't really store carrots like you can store grain. Um, and, and allow them to get the vitamin A that they need. If you lack vitamin A... If you have a vitamin A deficiency, chances are you're going to go blind or die or both, or you're going to go, you're going to die blind, I guess. Um, but again, like this stuff has been studied since, since it came out, since it, since it was approved in the 2000s 
for, for 17 years after it's been approved, and there's still no signs that it causes any kind of damage. But they just have this ideological problem of anti-GMO things, regardless of the fact that, this, that the licensing fee for it is free, that it's often given out to subsistence farmers to help them uh, during their time of need, and to, to, to mitigate the, the real problem that, that millions of kids die from every decade. Like, numerous millions of people die from each decade, which is just a lack of vitamin A, which could be solved so easily by just allowing them to go golden, golden rice. And, you know, what really pisses me off about this, these anti-GMO people, it's, it's all just a real big smug first world problem, like Luddite nonsense. And this shit has, like, detrimental effects to the environment because conventional crops and organic crops, they, that's a myth that they don't use pesticides. They use as much, if not more, pesticides than GM crops. In fact, these GM crops were sometimes produced so they could use less pesticides. And it also hurts people and kills people in the third world. Because, you know, I'm because I personally am afraid of eating it. Therefore, no one else should eat it as well. Like and it's it's just so people like natural news can sell you some snake oil bullshit like supplements that don't work. Uh, and meanwhile, they'll eat shit like grapefruits, which has been created by a form of genetic modification known as atomic gardening, which is where they grow a bunch of trees around a big radiated thing and like spray radiation on them until they start making crazy mutations. And hopefully they'll find one that works. That's OK. But God forbid that you actually do it in a lab and pick out the exact gene that you want to do, because that could be a problem. Or they'll eat things like seedless watermelons while complaining about Terminator seeds. What the fuck do you think a, water, a seedless watermelon is? They just I figured out a way that wasn't that kind of GMO to create a Terminator seed. Or to create a, to create a, a livestock that doesn't reproduce on its own, right? I mean, when study after study comes out and it just shows that this stuff is not any worse for you than conventional foods... And when every time they come out with their study, it turns out it's complete crank, unscientific bullshit, you know, and when their biggest advocates admit that, you know, they're, they have like these nefarious plans for a simple thing like, you know, GMO labeling and they admit it publicly. Um, like, I don't know how many times I hear about like some lawsuit that's happening against one of these kind of thought leaders, uh, supplement comp companies, because it's like it's hurt a lot of people or it's like homeopathic bullshit that doesn't do anything. Um, like, how long am I supposed to take to take these people seriously? But, oh, no, some fuck face used to work at Monsanto works for the FDA now. The sky is falling. Ah, but I'm not. I'm, uh, but I'm supposed to be OK with the organic guy working at the FDA, too, like. Fuck you. Like, I don't know how many times Dr. Mercola needs to deny the existence of AIDS before, like, I, I have to stop taking this guy seriously. Like, how much socialist bullshit does Greenpeace need to advocate for before you guys realize that they're that they're that they have an agenda and it's not it's not as noble as you think it is. Like the thought leaders of these movements are like total quacks and charlatan. They sell fear for a living. They push for Luddism, right? Neo Luddism. They sell supplements that don't work and can harm you. They have an effective lobby group, a very effective lobby group, as effective, if not more effective, than a company like Bayer. I mean, really, who has more influence at the end of the day? Is it someone like Monsanto, really? Monsanto? who just recently got bought out by a company that most famously produces aspirin, which you can buy generic versions of. Like, that's that's the company that ended up buying out the, the big bad Monsanto. Or is it possible that even a crazy, a, a cute girl with crazy eyes could take down Subway and get them to remove a harmless chemical from their bread just because she took a bite of her yoga mat on YouTube. Like these people have real power. Like don't, don't think that the, this is a David versus Goliath situation. It's not, it's very much a Goliath versus Goliath situation. Like these organic companies and these, these people who, who sell anti GMO bullshit, like they're fat cats too. They're sitting in huge mansions, huge mansions as well. They have, Big influence.
huge influence. They have a huge audience. Like fucking look, look at what Infowars has turned into. Like, do you think that these these people are like, you know, like just a little guy throwing a, 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 with a slingshot against a monster? No, they're a monster too. All these people are monsters. And if you're going to hold Monsanto to, to a particular standard because they're a monster, then you also have to do it with these other guys and not blindly buy their fucking bullshit all the time. Like, I'm sorry, there's no underdog in this match. And... While I am in favor of GMOs, like I'm, like I've said, like there's there's some de- there's some criticisms to be had of Monsanto for sure. They're they they have done things in the past that aren't that aren't necessarily pretty. Agent Orange is exactly one of them. But at the same time, you have to look at it through a skeptical research and say, sure, they may have done that fifty years ago, but what are they doing now? Who's who's in charge now? What has happened to the firm since then? The products they're producing now, is that Agent Orange too? No. So then we need to figure out real reasons why we need to oppose this shit and not just resort back to shit that, you know, barely, you know, <laughs> that, you know, that, you know, that nobody remembers. At least probably you don't remember. You probably weren't even alive back then. Chances are, like looking at the statistic of my audience, chances are you don't remember the shit because you weren't even alive back then. Some of you are. I know that. But yeah, there's no underdog in this match. And I, I'm fucking so sick and tired of, of this anti-GMO nonsense. Like, this this has always pissed me off more, far more than the JFK thing. Like, the JFK thing, like, if you want to believe in JFK, like, I'll, I'll have fun arguing with you. But there's lives on the line when it comes to GM crops. Like, we're talking about a lots of farm, lots of area needs to be reconverted back into farmland if we end up banning GMO. Like millions of children will continue to die because they de- they lack vitamin A deficiency because, you know, like we just tell them, ah, fuck it. Don't get golden rice. Go learn how to grow a carrot, idiot. Like this is this is where we're going. Like this is this is this is the trajectory that we're heading in. And it's it's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. GM crops is a tool. And like I said before, you can build a house with it. You can build a shitty house with it that falls and kills people. Or you can saw someone's head off it. It depends on what you're using it for. And you can't just sit there and say, it's the tool's fault. It's not the tool's fault. There will be a case. I guarantee you there will be a case where there is going to be a bad GM crop. There will be a bad GM crop that's developed. And it's not going to be done intentionally because evil Monsanto, blah, ha, ha. It's just going to be. Something like Fenfen, where it seemed like, oh, it worked over there in that country just fine. And then we brought it here. We started noticing some problems that they did not see. And, and it was pulled from the market. It's gonna, it, Something's about to happen because humans, humans make errors, right? They're going to they're they're end up creating something that, that wasn't too great after all. And while we're so getting so hysterical about the Arctic apple, oh, my God, it doesn't turn brown when you cut it in half. Like... People, one, people are dying, and two, when the real threat does come around, we'll be so numb to it that it's going to be hard to take it seriously when the actual problem does come around. So did you like this episode? Did I piss you off? Good. Go rate me on iTunes. <laughs> you could win a funny uh, – you could win an awesome and funny flag um, if it's funny enough, and you also could win a, a copy of Ben Stone's book um, – so I'll just wrap it up here, and and again, like this is one of the one of the one of the topics that I get kind of passionate about. So I'm I'm sorry if if I if I upset you. Actually, I'm not. I'm sorry if I upset you. Please look into this stuff before you guys start advocating against it. Stop just relying on these these propaganda pieces because that's what they are. Like these all these films are propaganda pieces, and it's just not just GMO shit too. It's like it's pretty much every. You know, every documentary that I've ever seen with a with a narrator is mostly full of shit. Like most of them, like Zeitgeist movement movies, uh, Blackfish, uh, Gasland, Michael Moore. Like, why are we all of a sudden just agree with everything that Michael Moore says? Why not? We saw a video on it. Come on, think about this. Do your own homework. Stop relying on bullshit. Worms. <laughs>